Hi everyone, it's Dr. Conlin. I hope you all had a nice weekend. So today I'm going to continue with toddler and preschool nutrition from chapter 10 of your textbook. So this will be toddler and preschool nutrition um, part two. The content we covered last week is part one. And this lecture, the part two lecture will be divided into two parts per video recording for your convenience. So <clears throat> um, after this lecture, I'm going to open a discussion forum um, for you to watch a video and have a discussion about. And I'll talk about that at the end of this lecture. So here are the chapter 10 objectives um, that we cover for all of chapter 10. And in this particular lecture, we will finish talking about 10.3, 10.4, 10.5, and 10.7. Last week we covered 10.1, 10.2, and 10.6. So these objectives focus on strategies to encourage toddlers and preschools to have a wide variety of foods in their diet, thus promoting healthful eating and helping to ensure nutritional adequacy, which we know is important to support their growth. Um, we'll talk about what the energy needs are and then some common nutritional problems of young children. And we'll briefly talk about components of a healthy diet for young children and where these recommendations come from. So to start with, we'll describe by the end of this part, you'll be able to describe at least two strategies, we're going to cover more though, that parents and caregivers can employ to encourage toddlers and preschoolers to accept a variety of foods in their diets. So toddlers, uh, they become increasingly mobile. You know, the, you hear that they start to crawl, they start to walk, um, they can move around and interact with their environment better. And with that is, is independence. They're becoming, even though they're still extremely dependent on their parents and caregivers, they do have a greater sense of independence now. And a lot of this independence comes from improvements in gross motor skills. Last week, we uh, briefly talked about gross motor skills and fine motor skills. And in your textbook, you can learn about other developments that happen. Um, but gross motor skills are the ones that uh, are the larger motor skills. So the ones we associate with walking and running and crawling and all of that fun, fun adventurous stuff. So um, by 15 months, um, typically, typically to toddlers can crawl upstairs. By 18 months, they can run. Usually their run is still stiff at this point. Um, and they fall a lot because of that. Um, but, you know, they can run. Um, it can happen earlier. It can happen later. So these are just typical numbers. Um, by 24 months, they can usually walk upstairs one foot at a time and also jump in place when asked. Um, by 30 months, they can alternate their feet going upstairs. And by 36 months, um, usually they can ride a tricycle. <clears throat> Um, so these are all like wonderful. Um, it's so much fun to play with toddlers and to watch them grow and to learn about their environments. But with these developmental leaps, it's important to keep in mind they have no sense of danger really. So, so maybe they can ride their tricycle, but they don't understand that they can fall off of it and get hurt, especially if they're going really fast down a hill. Um, they are at the 18 months when their legs are still, they still have a bit of stiffness to them. So they start running and running and running and they're so happy. And then all of a sudden they fall, right? They didn't see that fall coming. But as the parent or caregiver, of course, you kind of expected that to happen because it's normal. Um, so just keep in mind that they don't have a sense of danger. So it's, it's really the role of the, the parents and caregivers then to keep them safe during this time. So one of the reasons why it can be a tiring, more tiring time for parents because they have to constantly uh, watch, watch their toddler. This is when it's recommended to childproof a home um, to help prevent them from getting into things that could cause them harm. Um, and the leading cause of death among young children is unintentional injury. <clears throat> 
And with these, these developments are also developments in feeding skills of toddlers. So with their physical independence, they also are developing eating independence. Around nine to 10 months, some babies decide to, on their own, that they want to start weaning. So they might have a disinterest in breast or bottle feeding. <clears throat> Not all babies um, wean earlier. Some, some are happy and keep going. Um, but there are cues that parents and caregivers can look for that are signs that the baby um, could be ready for weaning. From 12 to 14 months, usually they're completely weaned from a breast or bottle. Um, for breastfeeding, culturally, usually 12 to 14 months is our norm. But of course, if we look at other countries, um, you know, weaning anywhere between three and five years of age could be considered normal. More and more, we are seeing more moms um, keeping the breastfeeding relationship going until the child really is ready to stop. Um, so I know I'm seeing more and more people breastfeeding until two to three years here in the United States, although it's still not the norm, um, but it is perfectly healthy and fine to do so. Um, around 12 months, um, a child can grasp foods, which is huge for them. It's also huge for a parent or caregiver because they can really allow the children to self-feed, which frees up some of their time. They don't necessarily need to sit there every meal and spoon feed or assist the child. The child is now grasping foods on their own, which is wonderful for everybody because the child has fun doing it too. A lot of them will really exert independence too. Some might even defy being fed by the parent or caregiver because uh, they want to feed themselves. So this is also the classic like spaghetti all over the face age, right? Because the parent or caregiver is giving the child autonomy to feed themselves. And with that, there's going to be mess, a lot of mess. Um, but, you know, it's, it's fun and parents should be encouraged to just Remember, it's a phase and to let their child have fun and explore because the more that they do so, they build up the skill and then that skill gets less messier and less messier. And then ultimately, there's really no mess over time. And that all comes with practice. Um, by 18 to 24 months, they're able to use tongue, their own tongue to clean their lips and they have a well-developed rotary chewing. So prior to this, they're moving their tongue, they're chewing more up and down, but now they can move their mouth in more directions. They can move their tongue in more directions. This allows for even broader table foods and textures to be introduced. Um, so some typical foods for a 12 to 18 month old, that would be higher choking hazard. Might You might be able to relax it a little bit more. You may not necessarily need to finely dice everything. You might be able to give bigger chunks of foods and things like that. Um, and then by 18 to 24 months, um, verbally, they have usually have pretty big developmental leaps. Um, so now they can actually say no, and they can say, I do it like I do it myself. Um, at this month, at these months, because of that, they're also easily distracted, which can impact mealtime. And I would say this is a really critical time. You start hearing parents have concerns about picky eating. And yes, picky eating is, is real. There are conditions associated with increased risk of actual picky eating. But a lot of it's also just normal developmental. So around this age, children say, no, I don't want to eat, you know, my favorite food that I've been eating every day for the past six months um, may not be pickiness. They might just be exerting their independence. So educating parents on that can be really important too. And there are specific, there are strategies that parents can try uh, when they're going through this independence phase with their child to encourage their child to eat a wide variety of foods. Uh, one of those is to give options. Children, you know, they want independence and control and choice. So instead of saying, here's your 
Um, here's your rice and broccoli. Um, you know, your favorite food that you've been eating for six months, you're going to eat this or you're, or go to time out or go to bed hungry. Um, that's not giving a, the child a choice, right? So it's probably going to result in a tantrum and then nobody's going to be happy. If you say you can eat your rice and broccoli or you can have this um, chicken nugget and corn, um, which one would you like to eat? Usually that can result in a level of success because now the toddler can have their own choice. So they feel like they have some independent control over, over the situation. Um, it doesn't always work and there's other strategies to try when that one fails, but just throwing some out there and talking, picky eating in itself could probably be a whole course. So we're not going to get that far into it, but just wanted to give you, um, an idea of one scenario. And then moving on from toddlers, uh, for preschoolers, now their feeding skills really pick up. They can use all of that messy practice with eating. Um, now they can actually use a fork and a spoon and at some point probably a cup. And it's much less messy and it's much easier for the caregiver at this point. Um, they also have increased texture variety. Uh, you should still cut foods for them, but they can certainly eat more whole foods at this point. A lot of like uh, blueberries don't necessarily need to be cut. I mean, it all depends on the kid too. Um, at this point, I know my son by age three, he didn't want me to cut his chicken nuggets anymore. And he was perfectly capable of picking it up and but taking a bite of it on his own. So I stopped cutting then. I stopped cutting grapes for him at three years old because he was fine with grapes. And in the beginning, I would watch him carefully with them, of course. But after a while, I learned that he was really okay. That being said, I know a classmate of his, um, when they were four years old, choked on like a half cut strawberry. Um, so it really depends depends on the kid in, in the situation. Um, and you should always be aware of choking hazards regardless of what the child's uh, abilities have been shown and just always keep it in the back of your mind that choking can happen. I mean, it can happen to adults at any time too. So just remember that um, as you're going through these changes. Um, so yeah, adult supervision remains imperative. Um, to prevent choking. You know, important thing is, and it's hard, I know as a parent myself, it's hard, but you should encourage toddlers to be seated during meals and snacks. Um, you know, we're getting, culturally, we are moving away from sippy cups to the straw cups, which is a good thing, and to keeping straw cups at tables and giving them only during meal or snack times. Um, or having them available in between, but in a safer place. Um, it used to be like a thing where toddlers were running around the house with their sippy cups or going upstairs with their sippy cups. And that would result them in falling often on top of their sippy cup onto their mouth, which you can imagine could be quite painful. So things like that, just think about same thing with food. You don't want them running around the house with food in their mouth. Obviously that could um, increase choking, and then stick to the recommendations to avoid high-risk choking foods like hard candy, popcorn, nuts, whole grapes, and hot dogs less than two years of age. And then after that, assess it individually. Where is this child at? Can they pick up a piece of a, a hot dog that's not chopped into pieces, but just like a round, like in the shape of a coin? Can they bite it? Um, do they know how to do that? Or do they still need their hot dog? or their grapes to be cut up. Um, and the American Red Cross is a wonderful resource. They do child and baby first aid classes and they have certifications available if anyone's of interest or it's always a good idea to encourage parents and caregivers to take that too. Um, so next we'll talk about feeding challenges. A child's appetite is related to their growth. We talk about how they have periods period of growth and then plateaus. 
and they adjust caloric intake to meet caloric needs. Caloric needs increase prior to those spurts because the body is needs substrates. They want to have the body wants to have substrates ready to go for that spurt to support the mus muscle growth and development that's about to happen. And then slowing growth results in decreased appetite. This is often frustrating for parents. My child was such a great eater. And then all of a sudden he's not eating now. Like that's actually normal. It's not necessarily picky. There's nothing necessarily wrong with them. Um, if it is assessed and it is considered normal development, then that should actually be encouraged. Parents and caregivers should encourage this because it's the child learning how to regulate their own appetite and listen to their hunger cues based on their body's needs, which is a good thing. And one theory behind adult obesity is that child is that adults who are obese as children somehow lost that ability or were taught to not have that ability to increase their own appetite. They were taught to finish their plates, right? What is finishing your plate doing? You're not listening to your body. Um, what if you're really full and you still have a lot to go and you force feed yourself? Um, that is going, we know, is going to throw off your ability to, to regulate your own appetite. Um, children do often prefer familiar foods. This gives them a sense of comfort and also control. And it's okay to offer f familiar foods. And there are strategies to, to expand a child's variety of food intake, um, especially if they do have partic very particular preferences, such as always introduce a new food with a comfort food. So if a child really likes strawberries and you're like, oh, I, want, I really would like them to eat another fruit like a mango. Um, so give them their comfort strawberries and also give them a little bit of mango and say, make it fun. Here, here's a new food. What color is it? Let's taste it. Let's see how it is. Um, so there are strategies for that that can work really well. Um, young children often don't like their foods to touch or to be mixed. That's not necessarily pickiness either. That's also part of normal development. Um, so fine. You don't need to to mix their foods together if they don't like it. Doesn't mean that they're gonna separate their foods forever. Um, and there are nice sectioned off plates now that you can buy. A lot of them are silicone because they're safe and they stick to tables well so they don't get dumped over with the different sections so you can separate food. And then um, similar to the comfort, you know, if your child only eats rice, um, but they'll eat rice and peas, maybe one night, after a while, the meeting rice and peas, you can try mixing the rice with, with the peas together and see if they like their two comfort foods mixed together, which is a good way to start exposing them to mixed foods. <clears throat> Rituals and feeding are common. Children thrive on routine, and that's also okay. Uh, developmental pediatricians will often agree uh, that Children, they need their routines, and deviations from routines can cause a lot of stress in children, including around mealtime. So rituals are common if they're used to a, a pattern. Maybe uh, they, maybe the parent cooks dinner while the children plays, and then they sit down and they have their dinner time and they have the plate they like and they have their cup to the right hand side. Um, you know, any deviation then from that routine um, could upset a child, um, but that's still part of normal development. Um, children also have natural strong preferences. They, they tend to prefer sweet and slightly salty and energy dense foods. These foods are, they're palatable and they provide energy needed for growth spurts. Uh, and this can all be part of normal development as well. Food jags are also common. What's a food jag? It's when a child will only eat one food or group of foods for a period of time. Food jags also, while stressful for caregivers, are also part of, of normal development too. And there are strategies to work with children uh, during periods of food jags. Importantly, uh, 
Children also imitate the eating behaviors of others. They're easily influenced. Their parents and caregivers are their role models. Um, and in older children, they're also influenced by the media. So if a parent isn't a healthy eater, if they don't sit down at the dinner table and eat their fruits and vegetables, uh, why why would you expect their ch child to eat their fruits and vegetables when the parent's not doing it? Parents need to role model good behavior for their kids. So the American Academy of Pediatrics is a really reputable resource for child health. They have 10 tips for parents of picky eaters. Um, and you can find that at the URL here. Um, there are many schools of thought when it comes to child feeding. This is just one of them, but it is evidence-based and um, you'll see it's also ra a rational approach. So picky eating, what we call picky eating is usually normal for toddlers. In that sense, I do consider that there is picky eating to an extreme, which I characterize, which I call picky eating. So all these behaviors we just discussed that are typically normal, I don't even consider picky eating. I consider it part of development. Um, so it's important to educate parents on this. They should you know, try not to, for them to get frustrated or upset or feel guilty by this. They need to know what's normal and um, when, when there are red flags for a concern. Um, parents can make healthy food choices um, and, and support their child's increased appetite or decreased appetite depending on what their needs are. So division of responsibility uh, is something you might see again if you go on to a dietetic internship. It's a golden rule for child feeding, and it says that parents are responsible for what to feed, when to feed, and where to feed. So parents pick out the food, they make the meals, they decide when and where they provide those meals or snacks. And children are responsible for how much to eat and even whether to eat from what the parents offer. So think about that. What does that mean? It means a, ch a parent um, does their part if they make their child dinner, if they set a time for them to eat, they sit down to eat, and they decide where that is. A child has a right as a human, as an individual human being then to go to the dinner table and decide how much to eat and even whether to eat. Um, and perhaps there are consequences if they decide not to eat, like they don't get any other food options or snacks or um, something gets taken away from them or they don't get a sticker, um, but they can decide that for themselves if they don't want to eat. And following the division of responsibility first, I like it because it takes away guilt, right? Like if a parent can say, you know what? I made this healthy lunch for my kid. They want nothing to do with it. Oh, well, I did my part. Their part is to decide to eat and whether to eat. Um, it takes away guilt. Now it gives the child control too, right? Because a child, they have control. They don't have to eat it if they don't want to. They can eat it if they don't want to. Um, and they can decide how much and whether to eat. And not forcing a child to eat, not forcing a child to clean their plate will also allow them, again, to learn that regulation over their eating so that they can hopefully develop a positive and healthy food relationship that will be lifelong. Because remember, an emphasis in this course is that what children learn with food, with nutrition, with lifestyle, typically tracks into adulthood unless there's some meaningful, significant intervention that occurs. So we're gonna briefly go through the 10 tips for parents of picky eaters. One is family style. Share a meal together as a family as often as you can without media distractions like TV or cell phones. There's a ton of research supporting this, that family meal times they work. 
Um, if you're a child, what to do if your toddler refuses a meal, avoid fussing over it. It's good for children to learn to listen to their bodies. Also keep in mind, they are regulating their calories. What if they eat a big breakfast or lunch? Maybe they don't have room for dinner. So it's a parent's responsibility to provide food and the child's decision to eat it. Pressuring kids to eat or punishing them if they don't can make them actively dislike foods they may otherwise like. Break from bribes. Tempting as it may be, try not to bribe children with treats or eating foods. Although as a parent and knowing this rule, it's hard. <laughs> I do it sometimes. I try to do alternatives like my older son who's four and a half now likes Pokemon. So I bought a bunch of Pokemon cards and that's motivating to him. So if he does his morning chores, he gets a Pokemon card, right? It could I could give him a chocolate or a food reward, but I know that you should really break them from food bribes. So um, I use I use cards and that works well for him. So finding something else that motivates a child besides food. That being said, there have been days where my energy is just so low and we need to get out of the house. And I tell everybody that if they sit in there, if they put on their jackets and their shoes and they get in their car seats, I give them a piece of chocolate or M&Ms. Children love M&Ms, by the way. And they're actually nice for bribing because you can count them, right? You can say, all right, you get two M&Ms and it's really not that much sugar. So anyway, try not to use it all the time. That's really my thing. <laughs> and good for anybody that cannot use food at all. Um, and then try, try again. Just because a child refuses a food once, don't give up. Can take as many as 10 or more times. Um, actually, I think that number is closer to 20 um, for a toddler to actually accept a new food. Offer a variety of healthy foods, especially fruits and vegetables and higher protein foods. Um, this can help children become used to other foods, flavors, and textures. Make food fun. You know, toddlers are especially open to trying foods arranged in eye-catching and creative ways. You can make a game out of it like, ooh, let's be a food detective or let's be a superhero and try this new food that will make us really strong. Um, that's fine to do and kids usually love it. Um, involve the kids in meal planning. I think this is a big one along with tiny chefs. Um, sometimes just cooking new foods will encourage children to try something they wouldn't otherwise eat. I remember my son would never eat a tomato and I love tomatoes. So, I mean, he's around them all the time. He sees them. He just would not taste it. I pick him up from his, free, his daycare one day and his teacher goes, oh, Ryan loved the tomato. I'm like, what? Like he will not eat tomatoes for me. And they grew them as plants. You know, they planted tomato seeds and put them in a pot and they grew them in their window. He liked that. He liked the tomato that he he grew himself and he was willing to try it. Um, so I thought I think that's a great example of how kids like to be active in the meal planning process. Um, and that's another reason why, um, you know, school, school gardens or any type of gardening often is really great for exposing kids to food and increasing the variety of foods that they eat. In my plate, um, there's a table, a nice table in your book, has different preparation activities for children by age, because keep in mind their abilities are going to be much different. A two-year-old's ability to bake or cook is going to be much different than at four, you know, at two. Um, not, neither of my two kids could really crack an egg by themselves without getting shells everywhere. But now my four-year-old's great. Um, he gets really clean cracks. It's pretty impressive. He can sit and listen. So it it is developmentally. There are different things you can do with kids. Um, so I, I really do like that table. Um, number nine is cross bridges. Once the food is accepted, there's what's called food bridges to introduce other foods with similar color, flavor, and texture. Um, doing that can help your child expand what they eat. So one example is if your child likes pumpkin pie, then try mashed sweet potatoes, right? It looks like pumpkin pie consistency, it's sweet. And then you could try mashed carrots once they accept the mashed sweet potatoes. <clears throat> and um, another 
you know, a similar thought strategy to crossing bridges is, is pairing of foods. So if there are flavors a child dislikes at first, put them with something that they tend to prefer, like something sweet and salty. You can pair broccoli with grated cheese, for example. Um, a lot of kids tend to like that combo. So when is feeding beyond picky? Um, a number one sign is when growth and health are affected. If they're tracking 50th percentile on the curve and all of a sudden you notice these food time or meal time behaviors with them that are causing frustration, maybe on both ends of the child and the parents, and you see that their weight just dropped to the 30th percentile, you, you that could be a flag for follow-up. If they have behavioral issues like extreme food refusal, if they have some anxiety or OCD type behaviors around food and meal times. Another sign is if these behaviors are at home and at school. If behaviors occur in more than one setting, that can be another flag that there is some uh, developmental or behavioral concern that's worth following up. Um, if there's any type of feeding difficulty that's known or unknown, you can ref always refer to a speech language pathologist and or occupational therapist for assessment. Um, and if there's any disordered eating in the family or the child's environment, this can predispose a child or and increase their risk for future eating disorders. Um, so just be aware of those that yes, a lot of what we call picky is really normal. Um, I don't even like calling it picky for that reason because it just makes parents feel guilty and puts a label on it, right? But there is a picky eating um, and there is a time when behaviors are of concern. Um, and then for that, perhaps, you know, that should really be what we're calling the picky eating when it is actually an issue and not just developmental that can be overcome with uh, otherwise pretty normal developmental recommendations. Okay, so with that, I think I'm going to stop here. Um, so we did 10-3, and then there's 10-4. Um, oh, here's the slide I'm looking for. Move that up. Okay, so let's end part one of this lecture for now. Here's a test yourself self-assessment. Um, there's two true or falses that you can find in the slides. Um, and then we'll continue with objectives 10.5 and 10.7 and talk about common problems and diet recommendations, um, including energy and nutrient needs.